Joshua Cooper is a lecturer with over a decade of experience teaching at numerous higher education institutions in Hawaii. Cooper has developed over 30 curriculum in political science to focus on core themes of nonviolence, ecology, human rights, and social justice. Cooper, has, Cooper also teaches journalism courses focusing on media literacy. Cooper has taught at the University of Hawaii, Hawaii Pacific University, and the International University Asia Pacific. Cooper also teaches at summer programs with a speciality on human rights of indigenous peoples at the National University of Ireland, Galway, and the School of Law at the University of District of Columbia, Washington, D.C. Cooper also teaches intensive courses on emerging issues in peace and human rights at the International Training Center for Teaching Peace and Human Rights in Geneva, Switzerland. Joshua Cooper is a human rights advocate engaging in global and regional mechanisms guaranteeing fundamental freedoms. Cooper has participated as an official observer at the United Nations meetings in both the charter and treaty bodies of the human rights machinery for over a decade. Cooper has prepared interventions, presented first-hand accounts of violations, held briefings to provide legal updates, met with officials and experts to pose questions to government delegations, and proposed recommendations to realize human rights around the world. Cooper has attended at every level of the UN charter bodies from working groups to the General Assembly organizing for adoption of international guidelines, declarations, and conventions. Cooper also actively participated in historic reform of the United Nations Human Rights Charter Bodies, resulting in the new UN Human Rights Council and its subsidiary bodies. Cooper is one of the rare specialists that has participated in the procedures such as the Universal Periodic Review for numerous movements across the regions of the UN and successfully influenced the direction of the discussion in partnership with grassroots NGOs. Cooper has recently appointed on the U.S. Human Rights Network Steering Committee for the U.S. Universal Periodic Review at the UN Human Rights Council. Cooper continues to volunteer for various indigenous peoples in meeting our movements in the global human rights machinery. Without further ado, Joshua Cooper. Aloha, how's everyone this morning? Good, all right. Aloha. So I just got in this morning. Uh, yesterday I was actually at the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. It's a meeting that takes place every April, May at the UN. It's the first time that really Indigenous peoples are able to speak for themselves and be able to participate in the decision-making process at the United Nations. It's at the highest level. And most importantly about it, there's a genuine dialogue between indigenous peoples, governments, NGOs, to really look at the historical wrongs, but more importantly, come up with a future that's rooted in human rights and reconciliation. Uh, lots of different examples of things that take place. We have dinners at the Quaker's house. They got the property at a good price back in 40s, I guess. And it's a great meeting where indigenous peoples and governments talk informally over dinner, but it's where actually all the strategy and the work takes place. So it's a very dynamic part, but it goes until at least 10 or 11 that night, last night. So just came up on the little Peter Pan this morning. I was on the Wicked Pirate. It's good that they have names like that for books. It's pretty funny. And um, I thought what I'd talk about a little bit today is just a little bit about what we do at the UN, but then more importantly, some of the most amazing developments still taking place, and most importantly, how you can be part of making positive change in the future, as I see you as some of the future leaders, and I look forward to work with you in many different creative ways. If you're looking at what's going on and how things take place, one of the things we're looking at this week at the United Nation is the Doctrine of Discovery. Has anybody heard of the Doctrine of Discovery in any of your classwork or anything like that? Okay, obviously it's a good thing we're looking at at the UN then since it's such a popular topic. Um, doctrine of Discovery was really the philosophy that the indigenous peoples weren't really human, they were subhuman. The land that they lived on really couldn't be theirs because they weren't Christians, so it was very easy then to subdue them, you know, plant a flag, this is our land now. Kind of a crazy one, you know, if you think about it, it'd be like me coming to your house tonight, just moving into the dorm, opening your fridge, discovered it, you know, really wouldn't work too well. You'd get me pretty angry with me after a while, like, I'm just tired of your discovering, you know, you're gonna have to stop that. And uh, we had that theme because through this doctrine of discovery, even though it was really coming out of a church, many of the states really use that then as international law and as an excuse to be able to be the new colonizing forces and be able to chart the future they wanted to. 
But really at the root of all that has always been this pursuit of profit and greed. It's about wanting other people's things, about not recognizing the dignity and equality in each human being. And if you look at what human rights has been able to do, it's really trying to change the direction of the world. It's trying to make sure in one way, people love to talk about peace, right? Everybody's Ben and Jerry's is peace, love, and ice cream. Every clothing company now has peace, love, and something else on it. But how do you measure peace? It can't be something abstract. It's really important is how do you know that there is peace in society? How do you know that there's peace in you? But more importantly, how are you know that the world is working in that direction? And if you look at anything around you, you can't really feel like things are going well. We've got more crises than you know what to talk about. We've got a financial crisis. We've got a food crisis. We've got a climate crisis. Definitely looking at entertainment, we definitely have a cultural crisis. And so, but what's the way forward? And human rights has really been that language. And it's really important to look at what role the United States has played and when it's been a leader and when it hasn't been. And more importantly, as citizens that have our human rights, we actually have to use them. And so if you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and you look what was coming out of World War II, the theme was never again. Never again will we allow people to be marched to gas chambers. Never again will we allow people to be slaughtered. Never again will we wait until it's too late. And that was the idea. They then had this tribunal at the time, Tokyo and Nuremberg, looking at International Criminal Court, realizing that you have to punish the perpetrators. And then it kind of went dormant after then. It wasn't really until Rwanda and former Yugoslavia that they then created these two temporary tribunals. Then, of course, really just recently, the most important thing is the new International Criminal Court. Everybody heard of the ICC before? Okay, good. That was better than the Doctrine of Discovery. Excellent. Okay. Just doing a little straw poll there. So International Criminal Court. I remember when I just was starting out in all this global work. I was in Geneva, Switzerland. I was, went there at the International Training Center for Teaching Peace and Human Rights. I got lucky the next year. I was able to be the professor. So it was a good turnaround one week, sitting in the room. The next one I'm teaching. And we snuck down to Rome because uh, they were doing the Rome Treaty. And it's pretty amazing that you actually can make history. You know, you get there at the Rome, you're doing the lobby, you're coming up with the criminal court. And now, since 2002, it actually exists. Any head of state that perpetrates a war crime could end up going to prison. It's just never been done before. But then even last week, on my way down to Sabah in Malaysia to help stop a dam that they're building there, they want to flood indigenous people's homeland. There it is in the newspaper as soon as I get on the plane. Charles Taylor, first head of state, since Nuremberg, actually punished for war crimes and crimes against humanity. And if you look at what Charles Taylor did, it's linked up with all the other problems. Charles Taylor, main thing, of course, horrific things that they did. Uh, the crimes, just almost unspeakable, but they have to be talked about. They have, we have to talk about, we have to know the truth. They had the smile. The smile would be where they cut off your top and bottom lip. Not good for the pictures outside being taken. They have the long arms, the short arms. Short arms, just cut everything off except the hands because that's how you vote. Long arms, they just knock it off at the elbow. And then also 50,000 people killed. Sex slavery, everything you could ever imagine, rapes you never even want to discuss or talk about. All this done in the pursuit of profit and wealth again, blood diamonds. And it's kind of ridiculous, you know? I'm sure we all missed Valentine's Day, you know? And then, of course, you're young, but, you know, never too young for love. And uh, romance. And, I mean, I mean, it's so ridiculous, in all honesty. We, the way we commodify everything in our culture, it, it's just got to stop. I mean, people that want to put a price on everything value nothing. We have got to understand that certain things in life are beyond a price tag, are beyond the market, have no price. They're beyond that. They're better than that. And if you look at what you'll see in life, in the end, you'll find that's true too. It's the experiences. It's the engagement. It's the way that you're able to understand the world. That's most important. And if you see how what Charles Taylor did with these blood diamonds, and there's two sides to it. If we didn't care about them, there wouldn't be a market. And the interesting thing is, I mean, the ads, every kiss begins with K. That's horrific. That's pathetic. I mean, that would just be the worst thing on the planet. No, it begins with a little. 
kind of a high thing or something else. There's a spark. It has nothing to do with, with K. And so it's both sides. And we have a responsibility, too, because a lot of the ways the world's being destroyed for us. We're knocking down rainforests so we can have the worst things to eat. We're knocking down rainforests and the rest of the world is starving and we're trying to figure out how to lose weight. It seems to be pretty good, like if the world's so out of balance and we're so worried about losing weight and the rest of the world's just trying to keep on a couple pounds and live for a couple more days, we can lose, they can gain. Everyone's a little sexier, everyone has a little bit more and some a little left. That's good, there's balance. So human rights is a way just to kind of measure our human happiness and put it out there in a certain perspective. And so the problem, though, is most people don't know their human rights. Anybody ever heard of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Well, it's a little less than the ICC, but it's a bad one. Universal Declaration of Human Rights is also always celebrate December 10th. That's tough as a college professor because after Thanksgiving, you kind of go on that turkey coma, you know, to celebrate genocide and all those good things at Thanksgiving, you know, and <laughs> watch football and see how much we can eat till we pass out, you know, good stuff like that. And... Um, then you don't really wake up, you know, you got Hanukkah, you got Christmas, no one wakes up to really Martin Luther King Day, you know, you always hope there's no human rights violations from end of November until at least January 15th, if I have to organize, I'm like, no, not this time, so December 10th, a tough day to know UDHR, but UDHR is a great instrument, it has 30 articles, all the really good ones, right, you got Article 26, Right to Education, which is why you're here enjoying this wonderful, fine institution of higher education, there's also Article 24, another good one to know, right to rest and leisure. So if you get a little too many assignments, there's a serious violation of Article 24 coming on here. <laughs> I cannot believe that. And so, you know, you got to know this kind of language, you know, it's good stuff, you know. At relationships, it's good too. Article 16 is a little bit more serious. It's right to found a family. It's more spooning long term. You know, Article 24 is more like it's a holiday, you know, or on the weekend, you know, kind of a thing, a little more casual, but always aim for the pure form, please. And uh, but Universal Declaration of Human Rights is absolutely crucial because it was the beginning. Eleanor Roosevelt chaired the meetings. We got the world to agree on these 30 articles. But then from there came all the instruments. There's the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. There's the... Committee on Racial Discrimination, CEDAW for women, the Convention of Living All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, Convention on the Rights of the Child, Convention Against Torture, Convention on Disabilities, Convention on Enforced Disappearances, and Migrant Workers for the last one. But these are all bodies that exist at the UN where people can participate and actually hold their governments accountable. And I've been fortunate enough to be able to be on the front lines, to be able to work with people who don't know their rights, that have governments that abuse them if they try to exercise them, and then the sad part is, we have all our rights, and we never even exercise these political muscles. And they're all connected. Freedom of thought is great. But if I just sat up and everyone went, it'd be like a meditative moment for like my closest 600 friends here. But you have to have freedom of speech, and then we could then discuss this. Then we have freedom of assembly, where it's not just me talking to myself, which would be pretty bad. Unless you have the cell phone by the ear, then you're saved. But you always get worried when you see people just walking down the street talking about themselves. After freedom of assembly, it's important. Awareness is crucial. But awareness without action, is just a great discussion. And then after action, though, is accomplishment. You know, the theme of our NGO, the Hawaiian Institute for Human Rights, is education, mobilization, realization. It's because with all this knowledge and all this opportunity that we have, we should be able to come, overcome any obstacles to be able to help and work with other people to make sure that human rights are realized for all. And this is the important part. It's all related. Peace, human rights, criminal court. The truth is, we have to be able to stop the people who make the human harm. We have to be able to say, look, Charles Taylor, if you're going to work with Muammar Gaddafi and in pursuit of blood diamonds, butcher 50,000 people, even though you're head of state, there's no impunity. But on the other hand, we also have to be able to measure how our society is moving forward, what we have to do, and what we need to do together. And so it's really important to look at human rights. The United States, not the best record. The United States has ratified out of the nine instruments I told you. What do you think? Three. Do we know the three? 
That's a good guess. I mean, you guys are really going to do well on tests if you can guess that well. That's a good skill. So, yes, there are three. Three out of, three out of nine. So as you can figure out from the math majors, not a good percentile. Not a passing grade. They turn in their homework later than you do. The United States always turns in the reports to the UN human rights treaty bodies at least, it used to be eight years. <laughs> it's a little tardy. And I don't know, I was working on that homework assignment and I just, it got lost at State Department or Justice somewhere. We couldn't get it to the table in Geneva. So it, it's just really upsetting. Even more upsetting is what we haven't ratified. We don't even recognize you as right, with rights. The Convention on the Rights of the Child ratified by every country on the world except for two. The other one, Somalia, doesn't have a government. We've got one. A little dysfunctional, but we got one. You know, and uh, it's ridiculous. There should be a campaign across the country of all youth saying, look, no matter who you are running for president, Romney, Obama, you have to ratify this for us. These are our rights. And it's crazy. I mean, you turn 18 and we expect you to be citizens and participate yet we give you no role in power until then. It's like 18, cool, go vote, get out there. You know, it's like being put in a basketball game, you don't know how to play, like, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> you know, I got the clothes, I'm looking good, all right, I'm playing, I'm playing, all right. I'm a citizen now, I'm participating, things are great. And so, you know, we really have to be able to change the way that this country's moving. We have to really, I believe, get beyond the partisanship and really focus on the people. And human rights is a very people-centered approach to making a difference in organizing. And I have to admit, I'm, I'm more fortunate than I could possibly imagine. I just went to the University of Hawaii. I um, you know, was able to then teach there. Every day I get phone calls from people. It's kind of like a little Batman superhero sort of thing. It's cool though, because those movies came out now, so it's all right to be a superhero. No cape required, just a little extra time. And uh, there's something wrong, and you, know, you get to apply everything you learn in school and more importantly, you get to actually help people and change circumstances. And most of the time, it's just understanding the decision-making process and then being able to mobilize people to do things and knowing when and where and how to do it. So in my opinion, for me, it's always two things. One is diplomacy, because you have to smile and work very nicely and get things done. It's a lot easier that way with honey a lot of times. But if they're not responsive, then... You know, there's been a lot of great people who have raised a lot of hell to make the world a better place. And then you got direct action. And I'm really good at that. I can shut down corporations or cities or countries, you know, depending on the cause and what it is. You know, we just figure out what we have to do. But most importantly, it's essential because we are losing languages. We are losing civilizations. And I hate to say it. When you look and compare indigenous to the industrial world we live in, I'm really not sure we could say who's the most civilized and who's the savages. We do some amazing sick things for things you can't even explain why. Going back to the blood diamonds and those kind of things. So what's really important is for us to know our values, to figure out who you are and where you're from and where you want to go, to be able to find your voice and be able to exert that in society so that the world that you live in looks like the place you want it to live in. And more importantly, with your vision to be able to change it, to look like a place that you want to inhabit, to be a place where you want to be able to change the world and make it a place that we all want to live in. So I very much am pleased to be able to participate and to be able to be with you here today. I'll be here all day. I'm going to go in different classes and different aspects. I'm pretty easy to find. I'm the only one, I think, with a flower shirt. But, uh, you know, yesterday was pretty funny. Yesterday I was negotiating with Mexico and I had this giant pineapple shirt. And it was so funny because it's like, take Mr. Pineapple serious. It's the pineapple and the big apple. Come on. And uh, we did. We actually got uh, agreements on the World Conference on Indigenous People that will take place in 2014. If any of you are interested in that, you can just pop on down to New York. I know now you could just ride the Wicked Pirate for two hours and you're there ready to participate at the United Nations. And it's been a pleasure. I've had some contact with Taft students. Everett's sister uh, went with me to Geneva a couple years ago. And also participate at the UN with the government of Tuvalu. I helped the government of Tuvalu because they're kind of small. They're only, anybody heard of Tuvalu before? Okay, that's even less than the ICC, okay. But uh, Tuvalu is uh, one of the smallest countries at the United Nations. There's only 10,000 of them. And their islands are being submerged. They're sinking due to climate change. 
And the responses of different people are like, oh, it's okay, they can just move. You know, and they're like, you obviously don't understand indigenous cosmology. For indigenous people, land is life. Your whole being is connected to a specific place. For some of us, that's hard to understand, you know? If we're stuck in the same place, that means we're just not doing cool things. But they have a connection to the earth. That is their whole being. That's their whole worldview. And to lose that view of the world is beyond a human tragedy. In a way, they hold many of the answers of what we need to have a world that's a balance of economy and ecology. Not just everything through the prism of profit, looking at everything through money, but looking more at the issues of purpose and being able to find meaning. And I actually hope all of you are able to find that in your lives because trust me, you'll be the best at whatever career you're doing if you're doing something that fits into those categories of purpose and meaning and you'll be able to make positive change. And everything is actually cool now with what we do. You know, there's the Lorax out. You know, I used to read that. That's the final exam in my college course if you took my 110 course. I read the Lorax and then you have to analyze it. And, you know, I figure if you can't analyze that, then I failed as a teacher. So there's no point. So the best part is the student starts, uh, the brown barbalutes and the barbalute suits. Those are the indigenous people. And the one slur, well, that could be capitalism and a tweed and a need that everybody needs. We actually don't. But it's everything we see on TV paid with millions of dollars to make us think we're not so pretty or to something and need to do something to buy something to make us better. So it's a good book, but now it's on movie so I can retire. Life is great. A little earlier than I planned, but you know, when you make it, you make it. And um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming this morning and uh, your presence and great applause. And <laughs>